Hi, welcome to Ultimate Wildlife Gardens. My name's Chris Caligari. Thanks for joining me. This video is about hedging and I'm hoping I'm going to be able to provide you with some useful tips and hints about how to get the very best out of hedges. Hedges are a terribly important uh, habitat that many of us can incorporate into our gardens. But the choice of species that you put in is absolutely essential. Why hedge is so important? Well, so many different ways. Obviously they provide nesting sites, but huge feeding opportunities as well. And if you plant a mixed hedge, like the one that I'm going to suggest, then you have a wide variety of flowers, flowering time, nesting possibilities, and all in all, it creates an absolute haven for wildlife and something that we really all ought to try and include in our gardens if we possibly can. If you're short of space, then a small clump, which will serve as a sort of mini woodland, a, a mini hedge, which you can keep confined by pruning. Um, but we'll talk about different ways of, of looking after hedges uh, as we go through the video. First of all, choice of species. Um, it's best really to plant it, plant them um, between December and say March because that is when uh, bare rooted trees are available. Now I normally plant at a, at a length of 60 to 90 centimetres high which is quite small, they come as bare rooted during that time, you won't get them at other times of the year uh, and they generally take very very well. They're quick and easy to plant, they're not expensive. Choice of species, well I reckon that I work on the basis of about 60% of, in this area, either hawthorn and or blackthorn. Now I've spoken to somebody recently who was thinking of planting a wildlife hedge and he was saying, oh yes, I want to plant a wildlife hedge but I don't want prickly plants. Well, really it is very, very important that we do include these prickly plants. So I'd say about 60% hawthorn and or blackthorn, and that will give you a good structure. Great nesting sites, lovely flowers, lots of berries, and if they're managed correctly, lots of berries, um, and it will, there will be a haven for wildlife, loads of things feed on them. Then other species are dotted along in between. I plant generally at a density of about five per linear meter. Now bear in mind that not all the trees you put in will survive. Some will succumb and so uh, I think five is a fair figure, five per meter. Um, so when I get my order I'll put in, I'll scatter along that 60% of hawthorn and or blackthorn, um, ideally both, and then I will dot in other species. Now these other species, it is really important to include them so that we have sufficient plant diversity. If I look along here, some of the species I can see immediately which I've included are field maple, an excellent plant for many wild species, wildlife species, uh, buckthorn, a few of those, very, very nice, um, older buckthorn if the ground is wet, but otherwise the normal buckthorn is the best choice. Um, then we have things like viburnums, we have gelder rose and wayfaring tree, uh, we have in here, let me see, we have wild bird cherry. I have four different species of wild rose. The field rose, the dog rose, the sweet briar. Um, we also have uh, things like the dogwood, a few of those, elder, of course hazel. Um, but the more species that we fit in, the more diversity we're going to have of plants and therefore the more diversity of animals we're going to get. They'll be feeding on the fruits, they'll be uh, feeding on the nectar from the flowers, they'll be nesting, they'll be caterpillars, 
there will be a wide variety of wildlife that this hedge will support. Let's talk about planting. The planting is not too difficult, in fact it's very very simple. If you're buying bare-rooted plants, it's easiest probably if I show you. For planting bare-rooted trees, you don't need to dig a hole and turf like this is absolutely ideal. If it's longer grass, I'd probably mow along just to give the newly planted trees a bit of a better chance. You simply take a spade, dig it in, waggle it round, and for most trees that will be sufficient. Plant them in, bare root it, push them in. If you want to you can make a cross like that, push them in, and perhaps a cane. I tend to use a cane just so that it marks the position. Then heel around and that's it. It's surprising that you can get a uh, plant, say, a couple of hundred trees in a day. I know it sounds a lot, but actually once you get into it, if the ground's reasonable, it's a very, very quick process. Having planted them in, then you can really pretty well leave them alone. Only a couple of things. In the first year, I would probably get a pair of clippers, or just by hand, and stop the aggressive grasses and whatever taking over, just till they get a foothold. And perhaps in the first summer, if we have a dry spell, I'll probably give them a bit of water. But once they found their feet, you can really pretty much leave them alone. Now in this particular section of hedge, which is about 40 metres long, I've made a jotting of the species which I've included, because there are so many. I've touched on hazel and hawthorn. I've also scattered a few hollies, which are so good for nesting, for berries, for flowers. Uh, blackthorn I mentioned, field maple. Um, the Viburnum opulus, the Gelder Rose, that's a lovely, lovely plant. A few of those are bound to find a place, surely. Um, also Hornbeam, uh, I wouldn't plant too many of any one of these, but a scattering of them would be great. I wouldn't just rely on one or two, because some will undoubtedly succumb, um, nature being what it is. They're good doers. Odd Dogwood, a wild privet, uh, Viburnum lant lantana, the wayfaring tree. I put a few elders in, I've mentioned the roses. Spindleberry, um, it's a euonymus, very attractive little plant. Many of these are, in fact all of them, are species that you would find in ancient woodland. So our wildlife is very well adapted to them. Um, wild privet, I've also put in here um, the odd bird cherry. I haven't put crab apple in here, um, but because I have one planted nearby, uh, a yew is nice. Um, poisonous, of course, but we've coexisted with yew for thousands of years, uh, and we're still around to tell the tale. So it's a great, a great plant for uh, many of the birds, in spite of the fact that the berries are poisonous to us. Uh, the seeds at least. Uh, quite a few birds love the uh, the berries of yew, so it's a very valuable, a very valuable species to include. Basically, you know the principle. The greater the diversity of plant species, the greater the diversity of animals which will feed on them and utilize them. Hedges are such a wonderful source of food, shelter, nesting, and of course, essential wildlife corridors. In this area, we have dormice. We're very lucky. I don't know if I've got them in my wildlife garden. I hope so. But when this hedge matures, it's a possible route by which dormice will be able to reach this area, and they will benefit from 
the hazelnuts from the various seeds and berries and whatever, so I'm quite hopeful. And the bottom of the hedgerow, of course, is a wonderful habitat on its own. Many plants will survive in there and it is an excellent, hedges are just an excellent habitat. I've changed location now to a piece of wonderful hedgerow which is not far from my house. It's an ancient hedgerow, it goes back probably a thousand years, certainly many hundreds of years. It's alongside a, a very ancient uh, trackway, now a road, country lane, um, and a lot of species within it, including virtually all the species that I've already mentioned earlier in the video. It's a wonderful hedge, it's probably about six or eight feet thick in places, and most of it is maintained by the local farmer who brushes it every year. But I'm next to a, a place in the hedge which is probably difficult for him to get to with the tractor and so it's become very overgrown, but excellent nonetheless. This is a wonderful haven for wildlife. The field's grazed by sheep, fairly traditionally managed, but it is a field which is, parts of it anyway, are under threat from development. I believe there's a planning application going to be going in for this field and so these hedgerows are not necessarily safe. You might think, well, just to provide an access in isn't too bad. Sorry, vehicle going past. Uh, isn't too damaging. But unfortunately, once you start to uh, have humans moving in, then a lot of damage tends to ensue. Particularly, these days you need a visibility display and often that involves the destruction of 30 or 40 metres of hedgerow and of course they can't, a hedgerow can't be regarded as simply a linear collection of plants. When a hedge is as old as this, hundreds of years, and it takes perhaps a hundred years for the full community of living organisms to develop in it. The other side is a steep bank which I know is populated with slow worms and a wide range of small mammals. I often see the tawny owl sweeping up and down this hedgerow. Marvellous place for wildlife. And also once you start to develop an area I won't apologise every time the cars go by, I can't avoid it, I'm sorry. Um, once you start to have human habitation uh, moving close to such hedgerows, we tend to have the dreaded tidiness gene kicking in. And so the wildlife hedge is subject to disturbance, heavy trimming, maybe even replacement. However, much of this hedgerow hopefully will remain. Now let me just turn on to one other thing. This hedge, and this is a, an absolutely vital bit of the video, which I, I simply cannot exclude. I failed to mention amongst my species list, the elm. Now the elm, as we all know, due to Dutch elm disease, the elm has become a pretty scarce species in the countryside but you'll still find it quite abundantly in the hedges and a lot of this hedge that um, I've been showing you is in fact young elm, well I say young elm, elm which is kept trimmed so it doesn't reach a height. As you probably know, elms, before they succumb to Dutch elm disease, they'll often reach somewhere in the order of 15-20 feet. I believe that's the height at which the, the vector flies and finds them. So there's an abundant elm in this hedge and something that we really ought to plant in our hedges. The witch elm I believe is a little bit more uh, tolerant to Dutch elm disease but the ordinary elm, the English elm, will be fine in a hedge and will almost certainly not succumb to Dutch elm disease. And of course it will provide foliage which 
specialist feeders will need. I'm referring to things like something less not so conspicuous. I believe there's a sawfly which specializes on feeding on elm. That's part of our biodiversity. Inconspicuous but important. And also, I have to rely on my ancient memory <laughs> I think it's the white letter hair streak butterfly which feeds on elm leaves. I think it will feed on witch elm as well. But if we provide the elm leaves in the form of uh, plants, shrubs in our hedgerow, then it will be able to feed on that. I've never seen a white letter hair streak, if I remember the name correctly. Um, but if we provide the opportunities, there's a possibility it will occur. There will also be other organisms which will need the elm. Just one last thing. I think there's a lot of value to be had in planting elm trees even if we know that they might well succumb to Dutch elm disease later on. They'll have many years of growth and when they die, as in this hedgerow, the standing dead elm is also of value. In the countryside, in our hedgerows, too often dead wood is trimmed out and of course it's a very valuable resource for wildlife. So if we plant a Dutch elm, uh, an elm tree, if it should die, then we can leave it standing. If it doesn't pose too great a danger, which it probably won't, um, we ought to leave it standing. If it does fall down, then we've got a log pile. The elm, marvellous plant, very valuable. I should have included it, in my, included it in my list of species. I have an elm, I have a few elms in my own hedge, which I showed you. I've moved a little bit further down now with this particular uh, view in mind, which is to my left here is the my newly planted hedgerow. It's been going now, uh, this is coming up to the third anniversary, and I think you'd agree it's getting quite well established. So I want to just have a word about management. I'll, in general, I'm going to let this hedge grow quite tall. There's no reason why not. We'll come on to that again later. But this winter, I'll probably cut it off at about this height. Um, the reason for that is because, although I, I'm a bit loath to do it, it will encourage bushy growth, more bushy growth. And we, what we want is a thick hedge with lots of growth in the bottom um, for excellent roosting and nesting sites. So I don't want it to get too straggly at this stage. So I will probably cut it back, which will be a little bit heart-wrenching but I think it's probably for the best. Now management, we've talked about what to order. Um, well, I haven't actually mentioned where I got this from. I used a company called hedgesdirect.co.uk which I found excellent. I must hasten to add I have no vested interest, no sponsors or anything else. Uh, it's just one company that I happen to use. I found they provided exactly what I wanted. They've got a wide range of species. They're British bred, which is very, very important. Some uh, suppliers can use uh, hedges or plant material from other, other countries. And that is highly undesirable, partly because of uh, diseases that you might bring in, but also particularly because their genetic makeup is different. We may not realize the difference, it may not be evident, but it's, it's not a good practice to do. So they need to be British grown. Also, um, Joel Ashton, I recently watched a video of his on YouTube, and he also supplies, I believe, most or all of the species dry rooted, uh, bare rooted I should say, at this time of year. With, they're normally available from about now, which is December as I record this, through till about March, February, March time. And that's the time when you want to get them, you'll have the maximum choice, plant them in 
and get them established before we get into the drier months in the summer. Right, now let's move on to management. I've moved a bit further down again because behind me is a really interesting illustration of how to manage hedges and how not to manage hedges. Now, if you, pl if you plant a hedge, a wildlife hedge, if you clip it every year, it will make it nice and bushy and thick for nesting, as I've just alluded to. But the problem is that you will be cutting off all or most of the, f of the flowers or the wood that will produce the flowers and therefore you will not get flowers and you will not get fruits or very very limited quantities so on one hand I'm saying yes cut it on the other hand I'm saying no let it go so the answer really is to compromise if you have enough room the perfect solution is to cut on a sort of rotational basis so that one year you'll cut a section of hedge, the next section of hedge you will leave, and you might do that for two, three, four years. So that at any one time you always have a decent selection of hedge which remains tall, overgrown if you like. Now that is excellent for wildlife because, because then you get lots and lots of flowers, and fruits and seeds and nuts. Okay, so why is this a good spot for me to talk about this? Well, behind me, you can see a hedge which belongs, in fact, to the farmer adjacent, and he brushes that every year with a tractor mounted machine and it keeps it tidy in the normal way. But for wildlife, that is not really what we want. Behind me is, in fact, mainly a hazel hedge. Now, that hedge doesn't produce any hazelnuts, none or virtually none. You'd, have, you'd be hard pushed to find a single hazelnut on it um, at the end of the season. But fortunately for me, luckily for me, his cutting machine doesn't go over and cut my side of the hedge. And so therefore, as you can probably see, I allow the hazel to grow up on my side and the contrast is huge. Where I have allowed it to grow, it is now, as I say, this is now early December, it is now covered in young catkins and this means that it is going to be producing a load of hazelnuts. Again, alluding back, small mammals, particularly dormice, they'll be so glad of that. That's such a wonderful source of food. So this hedge behind, as it would be managed on a farm, is, shall we say, suboptimal for wildlife. Because it, hazel is not especially good for nesting. And this doesn't produce any nuts at all, or wouldn't do if it wasn't for where I allow it to come over and grow. It produces nuts, but further than that, down beneath the hedge, it produces uh, woodland-like conditions. So it's very shady, and so that excludes a lot of very aggressive grasses, nettles, whatever, and so I've got more or less woodland conditions down there, and I get quite a profusion of violets and primroses, which again, wildlife will be able to benefit from, and it creates a little bit of a microhabitat underneath the hedge, which is so valuable. Right, can I end this video with a few things that we really ought to try to avoid? I can show you a couple of examples, or one particularly, uh, from close to where I live. I suppose number one, any hedging really 
wants to be for benefit for the benefit of wildlife the maximum benefit it really wants to be native species and only use native species others might have advantages but things to avoid are things like in this area I know several neighbors who plant hornbeam now it does provide a good hedge it's easy to manage it screens you for a lot of the year it keeps its leaves a lot of the year even when they're dead I understand the advantages and as an ex-garden designer I perfectly well understand the arguments for it but if we care about wildlife in this area hornbeam and beech are not conspicuous species and so therefore only native species another thing which again several people around here have done are doing and I can understand the reasons but I feel it is really misguided and that is to plant through weed suppressing matting and it although it does aid weeding shall we say it excludes an awful lot of wildlife and it is a pretty disastrous thing to do they put the matting down they might cover it with wood chip but it creates a desert so if you have a combination of something like an inappropriate species or it might be an ornamental privet or some other thing a lanissa or something of the sort there are very few creatures which can utilize that it's not too good for nesting very few things eat it it's really out of character and if we care about wildlife we shouldn't be planting hedges of that sort also beneath the hedge or within the hedge is a very important habitat and so we want our wild plants to be able to grow beneath the hedges we don't want to be excluding them so we must avoid using exotic species if we can plant native species which have over millennia uh, grown to support myriads of wild organisms then that's the way to go it may be at the moment you haven't got sufficient space to put in a hedge but maybe the information will be useful and don't forget even if you haven't got a garden if you can persuade a friend a neighbor a member of your family or even through social media of the right way to go about planting a hedge and the species to use you'll be doing an invaluable thing for wildlife I hope you found this video useful and interesting if you have I'd be most grateful if you press the like button and the subscribe thanks ever so much for those of you that has, have subscribed I am deeply grateful I only do these videos for the benefit of wildlife I'm not out for personal gain I do not have any sponsors or anything of the sort and your support through subscribing to the channel is really so much appreciated and if you could share it that would be even better because there may be folks that you know that you may be able to influence and thereby you'll be helping wildlife to a very great extent thanks ever so much for watching hope to see you next video thanks bye